part two, listeners' questions. First of all, thank you very much for Philip and David to coming in today and giving such a great description of both of your points of view. We have a bunch of questions from people on Twitter, but before we get onto that, I just wanted to raise one question about something that was raised in the discussion, which was, why do we think that uh, dualism seems to be the most intuitive response to this issue? Why is it that it appears to be the average way of thinking? Okay, so as I said a few times earlier, uh, there seems to be a strong intuition in favor of dualism, despite all the arguments, which, I mean, Philip agrees about this, uh, are against dualism. You end up with epiphenomenalism. Uh, there's strong arguments for avoiding dualism. But people, including us, I think, can't help but think in dualist terms often. So, so there's a kind of psychological, sociological question. What's the explanation for this resistance to monism in our kind of unreflective thinking? There's quite a lot of literature on this, uh, and I'll just mention a few of the suggestions that have been uh, put forward very quickly. So one thought is that it's part of our historical culture. We, we uh, Many of us live in societies that have religious history and religion certainly separates the mind and the brain and uh, maybe that lives on in most people's thinking. Another answer is the Yale psychologist wrote a book called Descartes' Baby. He thinks we're all natural-born dualists. He thinks the way the brain divides the world very early on, I mean, with, with very young children into the 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 minded, the, the sentient parts of the world, the inanimate parts of the world, uh, very deep in our thinking, and we can't really countenance something being in both categories, like the mind-brain. Uh, how many of that's two of us? I've got an idea, I've dubbed it the antipathetic fallacy, which is that the way we think about pains are sea fibers, and on the First, when we think pains, we imagine the pain. Oh, when we think C fibers, we don't imagine the pain. Then we think the C fibers leave out the pain, and that's a kind of confusion that's quite seductive. I think that's uh, here's 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 another thought. Here's a fourth suggestion. Uh, Philip thinks that when we introspect, the nature of our experiences is completely revealed to us. Uh, I don't think that's a good thought, but it may be a quite intuitively natural compelling thought and to the extent people think that they'll think that what's revealed to them is it's not physical so that's another thing that might push people towards uh, dualism final suggestion is that there's something about our cognitive architecture normally when we when we discover identity superman is clark kent we kind of had two files in our mental filing system one with the clark kent information one with the superman information we discover the same thing we merge the files and some people argue that the way we think about brain states is in one part of the brain the way we think intuitively of experiences in terms of what they're like is in another part of the brain and we just kind of can't merge the files given the way these two ways of thinking are housed in separate parts of the brain. And there's some literature arguing between these different explanations. And uh, I used to engage in this, and I now think, why are we fighting? These aren't competing explanations. These are different suggestions, that pressures that push us towards dualism. Maybe let a thousand schools of thought agree, uh, and uh, uh, five schools of thought agree. Maybe these are all pressures that push people towards dualism and that's why dualism is so prevalent first question from twitter comes from consciousness plus or adrian nelson the author of origin of consciousness he poses the question what are the ethical implications of panpsychism yeah i think that's a really interesting question and um not something i thought a great deal about i mean to my mind actually i think the only the only ethical the only it has had a kind of ethical impact on my life but only in one regard, and might be thought of as quite a surprising one. I think it stops me being vegetarian. I think I think if I wasn't a panpsychist, I'd probably be a vegetarian. I think. I mean, I saw recently a documentary, a really good mock documentary. Have you seen this? What's it called by it? the comedian Simon Amstel? Yeah. 
what's it called about it's this this mo- have you seen this david no, it's sort of um said in the fu- the future where we've where everyone's given up everyone's become vegan they've all realized what a horrible thing it is to abuse animals and uh and they're looking back into the past about how that happened and this kind of um help self-help groups about people who can't bear the guilt that they used to eat cheese and stuff and anyway it's very very good but at one point he says at this time humans realized that it was wrong to eat something with an inner life and um but the problem for me is i i am very very confident that plants have an inner life a conscious and so you've got to eat something it's hard to know where to draw the line so quite seriously i think if i just thought animals were conscious and plants weren't then i'd probably that seems like a good dividing line i'd probably be vegetarian or vegan but because there isn't that dividing line it's hard to know what's so i mean i i worry about animal suffering and take that into consideration but I, I i suppose i can't draw a line between what i think it's ethically permissible to kill and not um but yeah maybe that's a slightly disappointing answer i think i know a, my fellow panpsychist uh hedda hassel merck thinks that there's some really important positive um ethical implications of panpsychism it will help us sort of relate to the world in better terms but I I don't, I don't quite see that myself. I mean if physicalism were to work then we'd be sort of continuous with nature and all being physical. I don't think physicalism does work. Panpsychism does this panpsychism has the same implication that we're all sort of continuous with nature and um so yeah, so I can't yeah, I, I, that's the only one I, that, that I've got to is yet, but I I'm really it's an interesting question and I'd like to hear more about it and think more about it. Can I just quickly add one thing before uh, David speaks, which is, would not most people just say you'd have to prioritize the consciousness that can experience pain? And that, because mm. that, I think the, the biggest issue yeah. would be on an environmental basis, you might say, right, the, the trees and everything need protection. But even that would be contingent on the fact that if they're not protected, then other types of consciousness that can experience pain would be worse off. Yeah, well, who's to say trees can't feel pain? I'm not entirely. I was turned to this about to my uh, another another panpsychist of a of a form, um, Miri Albahari, who, who spends very interesting kind of uh, in the Hindu Buddhist tradition. She's a scholar, works on um, on, got a book called Analytic Buddhism, um, and she was saying, yeah, you know, sharing my my view that plants are conscious, and said, you know, watch the secret life of plants. I think I haven't watched this yet. But, you know, sort of sped up plants, you know, and she thinks, you know, once you see the plants sped up, you know, that gives you a little doubt that they're conscious. Yeah, so it's not obvious to me that plant, that trees don't feel pain, actually. And um... But I think you probably would agree that uh, we need to think about which which beings are suffering and maybe yeah. minimize suffering and maybe even plants get in on the suffering. I mean, presumably you're going to think that, I don't know, viruses don't suffer or mm. anyway electrons don't suffer and, uh, so so i i think that that let's put cutting to one side let's just think about uh, animal welfare and suffering and i think that's an important issue obviously and i think panpsychism is helpful in this way and you posed it don't we want to find out whether the animals that stick to animals are consciously in pain and i worry that the emphasis on consciously there is not being helpful uh we many people think about this look you know here we've got flies and bees and uh our animal protection laws are uh, are quite strict about especially in, res- in respect of research what you can do to mammals and octopuses have been allowed in but they allow the researchers free free reign when it comes to arthropods uh other mollusks apart from the cephalopods and so on and right many people think that the issue here is are they conscious and they spend a lot of time trying to find out a way of answering that question Mm. and i feel from my somewhat panpsychist point of view that's a red herring i mean Mm, you should you should think about what's going on in these animals let's let's study bees and see how they react to various circumstances what 
how flexible their behavior is, uh, uh, what they seem to find valuable, what they're attracted to, what, what dissuades them from things, uh, what they, how they react in various situations. And just on that basis, don't ask, are they conscious? Do they get across the line dividing the non-conscious? Just ask, are they suffering? Is this behavior making, I mean, is this treatment making them suffer? Mm. And, and decide how to behave on that basis. I think, I think that, that the agonizing about whether they're conscious or not is a red herring that can sometimes allow people, look at Descartes, to feel that they can justify things which clearly are unjustifiable. Right, that's interesting. So maybe there are sort of positive and sort of negative implications for animal wealth or maybe negative that's not the right way yeah. but so in one hand it, it might make us feel more sympathetic to bees mm. but on the other hand it doesn't give an obvious dividing line between the the things you can eat and the things you can't but um so there's two sort of now, well what you can eat so i mean I'm, I'm with you i'm not against eating rather uh complicated uh, uh sophisticated beings provided that they uh they don't suffer during their their lives and yeah. uh are killed yeah. painlessly, and perhaps we should think about their relationships to their their offspring, their parents, and so. I mean, there's quite a lot to take into account. But I I, I don't mm. rule out killing animals for food, but I do rule out uh, their suffering unnecessarily. Mm. So, okay. The next question is from two particular users. One from a not so unique username spelt with a three at the end uh, and uh, also from consciousness plus once more and the question is as follows what do you think is the most plausible answer to the combination problem yeah i was waiting for this one to so this i mean this is seen to be i guess the big problem for panpsychism and it, and it is a very serious problem so the, the worry is okay so we we attribute basic consciousness to the basic parts of the brain but then we've still got a question well okay well how do we get from the how, how do those little things with their basic consciousness make up my consciousness the consciousness of my brain and you know you know we sort of we have an eye we have a good understanding how parts of a car engine make up a car engine or parts of a computer make up a computer but it's really hard to make sense of the idea of lots of little minds making up big mind so this is just the i mean there's there's a, there's a lot of arguments to pad that out into you know but that's the basic intuition um and if we can't solve that people think well we've got we've got a big problem for panpsychism because it's human consciousness we want to explain after all or human and animal consciousness i i mean just as, i guess a a lot of most panpsychists will think of it as a sort of work in progress and think that yeah admit that currently there's no wholly adequate account of this and then some people think okay well that's a good reason to just forget it re reject panpsychism and um, my my reaction to that is it's a bit like saying to early darwinians well you haven't given a complete account of how the eye evolves so you know this this natural selection stuff must be a load of rubbish you know it's uh, so i you know this is early days and science of consciousness and you know, I think there's a very attractive theory here that avoids both the worries about dualism and, in my view, the worries about physicalism. And you know, th th there there are there are still some problems. Actually, I mean, just to, some people say, well, what's the difference with physicalism then? You know, physicalism has can't solve the hard problem yet, at least. Panpsychism can't solve the combination problem. Again, it depends on, and again, this comes back to the need to have a sort of deeper understanding of the the, the hard problem of consciousness itself. Um, you know, th the arguments that motivate it, such as the knowledge argument, purport to show that physicalism can't possibly account for consciousness. Indeed, that it's incompatible with the existence of consciousness. So if those arguments are sound, they might not be. David and I have been debating that. Then, you know, that gives us an incredibly strong reason to think physicalism is false because it's inconsistent with the existence of consciousness. We know consciousness exists, therefore physicalism must be false. Panpsychism doesn't have that. Nobody thinks panpsychism is inconsistent with the existence of consciousness. So even though it does have problems, such as the combination problem, I still think it's in much better position than physicalism. Philip, can, can I ask you a somewhat technical question? Might interest the listeners uh, about your own position. It's not clear to me exactly why the combination problem is a combination problem for you. Here's how I understand the combination problem. Some people put it like this. Look, take all the the neurons and they've all got their kind of proto-consciousness and put them together and then we get pains. But 
conceivability argument, I could conceive all those neurons with their proto-consciousness, but a kind of zombie that doesn't have pains, and since what's conceivable is possible, now we're in a mess. But your relationship to the conceivability argument is rather complicated. You kind of take something out of it, and what does the work from your own argumentative point of view is the idea of uh, phenomenal thinking being transparent, being revelatory. It's not clear to me why, from your position, you regard the combination problem as a problem. Why not? I don't. Well, so 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 phrase it. I mean, here, here's here's all the neurons with their product, and then put them together, you get this extra kind of consciousness. Why is that a puzzle for you? What, 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 what's what's supposed? Well, to... well I, mean, I mean, the way you put it there is actually the the, the way I. Um, originally framed it in in a, in a paper in mm. 2009 as as a kind of conceivability thing. So we right. can think of panpsychist zombies. Right. So all the little you know they're, they're like normal philosophical zombies, the physical duplicates of human beings, but but all their unlike normal zombies, all their little bits are conscious, but there's no consciousness associated with the organism as a whole. Right. Uh, so so you think you know if you think conceivability is a guide to possibility then they're possible and then that seems to give you reason to think that panpsychism can't account for human consciousness which is what and so that's a particularly worrying argument because you think like panpsychism is motivated by things like the zombie argument if the same argument applies back to the panpsychist then it looks pretty so, hopeless but, 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 so, so that would be the but of course you don't as does nobody think that in general conceivability is a guide to possibility it's right. only conceivability when thought using various concepts but it looks like yeah. the, the concepts involved here are, are, are consciousness concepts like good so how so what so you've got on the one hand the concepts of all the neurons with their proto uh, phenomenality and then you have on the other the the pain that arises when you put them together mm. and we're thinking both of those thinking of both of those in terms of a revelatory phenomenal concept but it's supposed to reveal what that when you put these together you'll get the big pain or well, if, or i mean the other way around when you when you conceive of the big pain you ought to see its parts that's the grain problem we were talking about earlier uh um, you have the problem both ways round. If it depends, so I think conceivability entails possibility when you grasp the natures of everything involved in your conception. I mean, if we, if these panpsychist zombies yeah, were just, just talking about consciousness concepts when we attribute consciousness to their parts and maybe um, sort of physical concepts to describe dispositional causal roles, they seem kind of transparent as well. So it seems like we understand everything that's going on. I mean, but I mean, one possibility is well. Mm-hmm. Now, there are other components that are essential to combination. So in, in my paper in the Oxford University Press Panpsychism volume that mm-hmm. came out last year, mm-hmm. I suggest what, what I call the phenomenal bonding solution, that maybe it's, I mean, it seems like what's important to combination in general is the relationships. So maybe there's, it's the, some, it's the physical relationships between the uh, micro-level entities that, that matter. Um, and so then we, but then, it's not obvious if you're a resilient monist, it's not just kind of um, intrinsic properties that we, physical properties like mass and charge that we don't have a, a grip on the intrinsic nature of, but relationships, spatial relationships, causal relationships. So so that would block the conceivability argument. So there's some oh. essential component of combination, which I dub phenomenal bonding, which is a physical relationship, but we don't know it's intrinsic. If we knew it's intrinsic nature, then the whole thing would be transparent to us. Um, so that's that's one solution I entertain. I mean, in a way, it's not wholly satisfying because we we there's something we don't get. We don't get the nature of phenomenal bonding. Maybe we never will. But I, I'm actually quite happy with the idea that the nature might not reveal all its secrets. And you might think, oh, that's that's very defeatist. But um, I think we've been lulled into a kind of false confidence because of the success of physical science. You know, think, oh my God, we're getting everything. This is. But from the Rossellian monist perspective, the reason physical science has been so successful is it's just focused on causal structure. So we know a lot about causal structure, but if you think, you know, we're naturally evolved creatures, well, I think we're going to be able to get at the intrinsic nature of all of matter. So, um, so I, can, so, I can get behind that. Philip. So, you're start, starting to sound like me. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, more of you. Oh, maybe I'll back up. So, so I mean, I, I, I kind of, I also think maybe we don't need to go into this. I also think. 
Cosmopsych is uh, so so I talked about priority monism before. If you if you can join priority monism with panpsychism, you get the view called cosmopsychism that so the 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 everything is grounded in facts about the conscious universe. I think that helps with some aspects of the combination problem. It's a multifaceted. I mean, maybe I won't I won't go into that the details. I mean, that's where I, that's why I ultimately one of the reasons I ultimately go for cosmopsychism and the the final. Ch- next to the panel to the chapter in my book but um but i'm i'm probably i don't think it solves all the problems i don't think it solves that conceivability problem ultimately so i'm happy with you know there's something we're not getting here and maybe it's just some feature of matter that we can't access it's sort of colin mcginn had a famous paper that readers might be interested in in 1989 can we solve the mind body problem and he argues we, we just can't get it the um the, the the features of matter that underlie consciousness um, I don't agree that there's that he has a knockdown argument. You no, know, so Dirk Perraboom responses and think, well, why can't we? And Chalmers, to an extent, theorize our way to the nature of these things. So I'm sort of cautiously pessimistic. I think we'll probably never get a completely transparent explanation of of um, you know how human consciousness emerges from more fundamental forms of consciousness. But we can still keep trying, and you know maybe I'm wrong. Um, and the history of you know the track record of science doesn't, I don't think, give you any confidence that in this regard. But um, but then but then the point is so again to just to repeat the point. Okay, well, why not physicalism? But the point is, I think there are good arguments that physicalism is just incompatible with the essence of consciousness, which is not the case with panpsychism. So even if we can't, human limitations mean we can't fill in all the details. I still think we've got overwhelming reason to think it's you know it's it's the the best guess at the the nature of reality final question comes from longtime listener kelly perez her question is scientists can now reproduce artificial organs but will they ever be able to reproduce artificial consciousness oh good question what do you what do you think david um yes yes i i i I don't have a problem with that so We've kind of touched on some of the issues here. Here's the way I think about it. I, given my panpsychist inclination, I, I don't think there's any kind of uh, huge problem about uh, machines getting to be conscious. Uh, if we agonize about whether they're conscious or not, we might uh, find that we can't quickly arrive at a satisfactory answer. But here's one thing I feel pretty sure about. If there was a machine that was quite person-like, could pass the Turing test, commanded data in Star Trek, uh, uh, we wouldn't have any doubts that this was a being that was a proper object of moral concern. Uh, If this being could... uh, have plans, concerns, uh, exhibit distress, uh, argue, uh, we'd uh, treat it like uh, a person. We'd regard it as an object of moral concern. I'm not sure how far off we are from this. Who knows how quickly artificial intelligence is going to move. It's not hard to imagine people interacting with uh Computers, programs on computers, Siri, Alexa, and so on. I mean, they're, they're just the uh, in a way that will make them and most of us start to feel that uh, we should we should worry about the welfare of these beings. I think that at that stage we wouldn't have any doubt that they were conscious. I, th- I think the, the the decision about their being conscious in the way that requires uh, moral concern will follow on. Uh, the, the the nature of the activities not something that should be an input to the question of moral. I mean, it's effectively the point I was making about about uh, how to decide whether bees are suffering or not. The final point that that I think really does bear thinking about is that you might worry about about how it's going to be for these beings. There will be beings that. I think we'll all count as conscious that will be object of moral concern, which will be completely within our power. And the people who worry about the singularity think worrying about the converse possibility. But believe me, we control the switches mm. in a way they don't. And we will be able to to mistreat these beings. And it's something that people should maybe start worrying about quite soon. Well, yeah, I mean, that was nicely represented. What, what was that recent HBO TV series? 
Westworld. 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 Oh yeah. yes, I know they get Where they, they get to be conscious and then they start cutting up nasty, don't they? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, well, they no, were, but we're pretty harsh with them. I think yeah, that's, well, that's no, the yeah, that's awful. The, wow. um, exactly. I mean, I I, I wrote some. A piece, some some short about about Westworld actually mm-hmm. for the the questions website which is linked to on my blog somewhere and I mean I think it's a, again you find in Westworld though there's this sort of ambiguity about what consciousness is supposed to be that that comes up again and again it is consciousness it just experience the way we've been using it today or is it self awareness the awareness of self or is it some kind of radical free will. Mm-hmm. And I think in Westworld, you're sort of flicking between the two and those, you know. The, and really, it's you know the creatures are conscious when they start behaving in a way that goes against their programming, have some kind of radical free will. Um, I was arguing with David Chalmers on email about this, actually. He thought that, that that's what they meant by consciousness in the show. I, I kind of think there was a little bit of ambiguity, and what they really meant was... They were, you know, that's when they become conscious when they get free will or something. Anyway, it's probably a little bit indeterminate. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I mean, this is if causal. Clo- I mean, may, you know, maybe maybe David's wrong that a causal cl- the universe is causally closed, and maybe you know, <gasps> if no. if that were wrong, you didn't say that before. So I'm I'm <laughs> slightly agnostic. I mean, I'm kind of happy to concede, and I, I do sort of assume it in my work. But suppose it were true, then you know, if there were these radically new causal processes that started emerging at some point of organic complexity then that would be you know that would be a clear dividing line and a sign that you know all right this is the mark of consciousness but if that's false so let's assume it's false let's assume you know the the physical world is causally closed then you know i agree with david there's not going to be this clear dividing line you know we're going to certainly assume commander data is is um is is conscious and so i mean just i mean come back to the question I i mean if you're a panpsychist in a sense it's very easy to create artificial consciousness because there's consciousness everywhere. But I mean, I suppose the question is, well, how do we create, you know, can we create sophisticated kind of macro level um, rational consciousness, I suppose. And um, yeah, then I'd probably agree with David. And I think there the mightn't be that much difference between, well, the physicalist and the, the yeah. panpsych. It's going to depend on your theory of consciousness, you know, and your theory of what it takes for it to be consciousness, which is very much in part an empirical question. It's a theoretical question as well. And I think it's an open question. And, you know, it's it's not obvious that the panpsychist or the physicalist will have different answers to that. You know, the, it's, the, 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 you, it might be, you know, if we have a scientific answer to what is physically required for consciousness, and, you know, the, the pan, maybe the panpsychist, the physicalist, and the dualist will all agree on that, but just give their different metaphysical accounts of what's going on. So... Yeah, so I would probably just ditto what David said, assuming causal closure is true. I am, I'm not I'm not entirely. Could I just? Sure. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to raise one one final point. I'm not sure if this necessarily makes sense, but if so, if we're claiming the, depending on how far off in the future is that we can actually say map and create a conscious mind in a computer then doesn't that raise the whole issue of if we create a bunch of beings inside the computer that therefore because we've created that technology that it's as likely that we could be in that same type of technology ourselves from another removed point Uh. and if that is the case then doesn't that kind of answer the question anyway because our consciousness is just a mapped version of something else that was mapped from something else it could be like an infinite loop going through there because surely if we've if we've created that technology it's more likely than not that we we are part of the same issue yeah i don't i don't follow that last bit of argument why is it if we created technology it's likely that well it's the because why uh, so, I mean, it's very, very unlikely that there should be beings who can create such technology. Look at the history of life on Earth. It's been going on for the best part of four billion years. And uh, the kind of technology that we're talking about has been around for, I don't know, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years at most. I mean, uh, beings that can develop that kind of technology are complete uh, biological historical freaks and... Uh, uh, so the chances of there being another one creating all of us uh, is minimal. And anyway, wouldn't we have noticed the glitches like in like in the Matrix? 
Uh, well, no, because I, I guess the point would be is if we were able to completely replicate mm. our own consciousness, that they would be capable of making the same thing in the future themselves. Mm. So, well, okay, perhaps not entirely, like, definitely likely. It's sure, surely a possibility if we were able mm. to replicate it. But there's another question. If this is put, I think, did you put it in terms of computer simulations or... Yeah. Um, whether a computer simulation would involve consciousness. It's not obvious to me that... The, I don't know. It depends on your theory of consciousness, and I think it's an open question. But I guess panpsychists to Rossili and Monas, who tend to think of consciousness as sort of a real categorical feature of the world and not going to think it's automatic... going to have be sceptical of the idea that a computer simulation, a sort of virtual entity, would be conscious. So that might be one way around. If we If, if we've got good reason to think that virtual entities are not conscious then oh then that gives us a nice answer to an argument that we're not virtual entities which is which i would like not to be i think but what would what would be the biggest difference between an artificial mind that we put into a robot body and one that was in the computer how how is that fundamentally different so I don't think it's different. I'm curious, mm. isn't there room mm-hmm. for you to say that consciousness requires kind of biological wetware natures and silicon ones won't do the business? And uh, I mean, is there room and are you attracted? Well, I mean, I think panpsychism is, uh, is open on this and it's, okay. it's, it's as open a question as if the physicalism. So, yes, yeah, one thing is, can you have a silicon conscious thing? Mm-hmm. Um but then if you've just got a computer simulation, well, it depends how we're thinking of computer simulation. Maybe, you know, maybe the, the, yeah. the, I guess you tend to, maybe the hardware would be conscious, but it, the software is sort of, I guess a Rossili mode is going to be inclined to think that software isn't strictly speaking conscious because it's not a sort of metaphysically real entity. That's, you might want further clarification or whatever. So I, mean I wonder about, real, so that's nice. Uh, and, and you're right that, Thank uh, you. That physicalists and uh, Rossini are completely neutral on whether com- commander data is conscious. Both of us can require or not require that you need uh, uh, carbon-based chemistry rather than silicon-based chemistry or something mm. uh, to get consciousness. So that's open. I'm slightly interested in your idea that the hardware is going to be maybe conscious, but but the 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 virtual uh, structure is is not really in the business of being conscious because it doesn't have enough oomphy nature at the bottom <laughs> because uh that makes me think about human brains and all the neurons and then there's more abstract thing the pain yeah. or the visual experience isn't that a bit like the virtual aspect yeah, of the machine it's a good and point because it seems like it's combination, natural combination to think, problem it's natural again. to think if you were seeing notice that consciousness human consciousness corresponds in some way to information states in the brain. Because, I mean, it, it doesn't look like human consciousness doesn't look like yeah. the physical, the most natural way of carving up the physical stuff in the brain. It looks more like some the kind of informational properties. And informational properties seem a bit like software, a bit abstract, a bit yeah, yeah. sort of not fully... Re- so, yes, yeah, the problem. I mean, yeah, my hope is going back to the structural mismatch problem that does... Well, the, these informational properties are real categorical features of the brain. They're just a, a really funny slice of the brain, you know, from the perspective, from the third person perspective. But have you been looking at recent stuff about proportional causation, kind of anti Kim arguments in favor of the view that high level properties uh can be causally efficacious in the fullest sense. So the the generic property shared by all the beings who want to, say, hail a taxi, is the property that should be thought of as the, the, the cause of their waving their arm and not the more specific neural property that differs between right, the different right. beings. Proportional uh, causation. Proportional causation, um, that's Diablo, Menzies uh, and List. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Causation is a high-level yeah, physical PhD phenomenon. Student exactly. Uh, I, I was just thinking that that's... that's one resource you could appeal to to back up the idea that these these relatively generic high level properties are really uh, physically significant properties and uh, uh, right. th- th- thereby right. thereby make some pro- progress right. with, with, with the the, yeah. the mitch- mismatch yeah. problem.
Thank you very much for joining us for this very special episode of the Pan Psycast. Thank you again to Philip Goff and David Papineau for sharing your philosophical insights with us and our audience today. If you'd like to hear more about Philip Goff and his new book, Consciousness and Fundamental Reality, you can visit www.philipgoffphilosophy.com. And if you'd like to find out more about David Papineau and his new book, Knowing the Score, you can visit www.davidpapineau.co.uk. Links to both websites are also on our website, thepansidecast.com. You can follow both philosophers on Twitter as well. Philip Goss is philip underscore goff. And David Papineau's is at David Papineau. You've been listening to the wonderful voices of Mr. Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. Gregory Miller. Thank you for listening. Associate Professor in Philosophy at Central European University in Budapest, Philip Goff. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. And Professor of Philosophy at King's College London, David Papineau. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. And me, Andrew Horton. Thank you very much for listening. Superb. Okay. Great. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks. That's very good.